chapter 12, verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 12. And now, and now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? Powerful, isn't that? What does the Lord require of thee? How many of you know that that should be the question of all questions in the church today? It should be the question that we kind of ask ourselves: what doth the Lord want with me? How many of you know that uh, living your life to please yourself is an easy thing to do? And when you come to this place to realize God, like he did with the two little donkeys when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, God hath need of them. Yeah. So God says, I have need of you. And, and you're asking in reverse or you're asking back, what doth the Lord require of me? Right. That word require, interesting word. But to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all of his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And with all thy soul to keep thy commandments and the statues of the Lord. Have you hear that? He tells him what? What the Lord requires. You must fear the Lord. You must walk in all of his ways. Fearing the Lord is one part. Walking in it is another. And then to love him. And then to serve the Lord. And then to do it with the right heart. And to do it with the right soul, your whole mind, will, and emotions. And keep his word and the principles of his word. Powerful. Now, he has shown thee, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require thee. In the Hebrew language, I want to break it down before I give you the next verse. The next verse is a parallel verse to this. Now, in the Hebrew language, there are two different words that are both translated in English, the word require. So the word require in English has two Hebrew words. It is the inflection. It is how it's used in the sentencing that makes it say one way versus another. Have you understand what I just said? Yeah. And many languages use the same word to meet, mean two different, three different things. In Hawaii, you can say aloha, and it means one thing, and you can say it again in another inflection, and it means another. One's a greeting, one's an exodus. And so this language of the Hebrew is that way that it breaks this word down, require. It breaks it down into two different ways, and I want to show it to you. Uh, in Deuteronomy, the word is like inquire. For the Lord require. How many here? It's like the word inquire. So it means uh, the Lord is asking of you. What does the Lord ask of you? How many of you hear it that way? And that's what it's talking about in, in Deuteronomy. It's saying, What's the Lord asking of you today? What is it He wants from you today? What is it God wants from your life? He owns your life, He owns the whole earth. And he has everything, and he's come today to ask of you. How many of you would, would, would help me if I were to ask you, I need you to help me. I'm really uh, in need. I, I have to pick something up, or I have to carry something or do something physically. If I came to you and said, could you help me, would you try to help me? Well, your neighbor, if your neighbor said to you, uh, I, I, a box has just fallen and it's, 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 you know, in my doorway or something and I need you to help me. And you would go over and help your neighbor. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And if you see somebody broke down and I've had this happen before, I see somebody broke down and I used to carry some tools and things in my truck. And so I can stop and because I have some background, uh, I can help usually fix. Uh, I remember one day I was running a big loader they call them a big one this is a massive loader and uh, we were removing a train track and we had to remove it in a certain amount of time because the train was not allowed to stop the train had to keep going so we had to move the track dig up the underneath of it put in the storm drains and then put the track back down while the train just went right on by Matter of fact, my loader and I were sitting right beside each other when the train, I mean, we were sitting on, I was sitting on the loader when the train went by after it was all put in. 
And that morning when we started, we started at about four in the morning. And uh, I was uh, over at the, there was a filling station right over the little hill from where the track was, because the track went behind these little stores. And uh, there was a lady there and she was getting gas and the opposite tire from where she was standing was, was going down by the fact that time she filled it up, it went flat. And she filled it up and, and the car was leaning and somebody said, ma'am, you you got a flat. And she went around and went, oh my gosh, she started crying. And she said, I don't have a, I don't have a, a wrench, I don't have the tool. And, and she said, I don't have the jack. And then, oh my gosh, and she was just, and I got to get to work. I was late the, the other day, and she was just letting everybody know she was in a pickle. So I went over to it, and I looked underneath of it, and I said, ma'am, uh, if you don't mind, I'll help you. And she said, sir, if you do that for me, that'd be the kindest thing I've ever had. So I took the loader and picked her whole car up. Wow. <laughs> took the back end and just pulled it up in the air. I mean, I could have put it up on, and stood up, you know, and walked under it if I wanted. I just picked it up. And I had a wrench with multiple heads on it. I went over, took the lug off, got the spare out, put it on, tightened it back up, set her car back down, and boom, she was gone. And, uh, and she was in tears trying to thank me. And uh, how many of you know, you see somebody in trouble, you want to you wanna help them. Come on, is that right? Am I in the wrong church? All right. And, and in the same way, is the way this is written in Deuteronomy, what does the Lord ask of you? So God is, can you imagine that? Do you know the biggest thing that will be evidence of the next great revival that will come to the nation will be those that are willing to, and know how to ask of the Lord. The greatest revival coming will be based on those people who know how to ask of the Lord. If you learn in prayer how to ask of the Lord correctly, you'll get the answer to your prayer. And so here it is in Deuteronomy that the word says, what is the Lord asking of you? Can you imagine that? That here you are, a human, just a human being. And God has come today to say, excuse me, excuse me, uh, I need help. Could, could you help me? Wayman, can you imagine God coming to you today and say, uh, Wayman, I need help? It's pretty heavy, isn't it? Yeah. And have you know, in perspective of the day we live in and the time we live in with, with, you know, Christmas and all, can you imagine that we know there's people on the street asking for help, but could you imagine God coming and saying, I need help? Micah, Micah 6, 8. He has showed you, amen, oh man, what is good. I mean, the Lord showed you just how good he is. And he has shown you what is good. There is no excuse for any of us to not know the difference between good and evil. We have no excuse in this day to not know the difference between good and evil. Evil is everywhere. It is blatantly um, magnified. It is just in our face. And for you to say, I don't know the difference, that's baloney. You know the difference between good and evil. But our problem is we call good evil and we call evil good. We got it mixed up. And he says, what is good, old man? And what does the Lord, here it goes again, require of you but to do justly and to love kindness, mercy, and to humble yourself and then walk humbly with your God. How do you hear that? So now we have the second way this Hebrew word is used. Are you with me today? The second way that it's used is entirely different when you use the word require than it was in Deuteronomy. And it fits because back in Deuteronomy, it was in the beginning. Now in the book of Micah, Israel has matured and come to a new place where God would ask this question, what the Lord requires of me, in a different way. 
Come on. And he has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require. Now that word there is the word totally different. It means what does the Lord demand? What does the Lord demand of you? Now that's different than when he first required of you. When he first asked of you, he's now turned it to, I'm not asking you anymore, I'm demanding you. I, I have in my heart this vision that has been there for days and weeks now that the, the Lord has said to me so many times, God's people are in the place of choices and many have cho chosen to be led by a bridle and a bit versus to be led by his eye. The Bible says there's two ways that God leads man. He leads him with a bridle and a bit. If you know what that is, that's the bit in the mouth of the horse. Or by his eye. That means that his eye is guiding you. If he looks, you go. How many of you know, growing up, my father could look at me. And I trembled. When I, when I raised my kids up here in the church, uh, and they'll still tell you today, I could look at my children and I would do this while I was preaching like I had something in my eye. I would go like this. And when they looked, some of the other kids would say, hey, your dad, I'm sure Charlie and them remember this. Uh, hey, Charlie, you remember this? Yeah, he's laughing. Uh, they would remember it because they would say to my children, your dad's doing that eye thing. <laughs> what that meant was, when we go home, I'm going to beat your butt. <laughs> Simple. And, and God wants to lead us, but he doesn't want to use. I, I had a horse. I had a mule. And I had a donkey. And some of you go, Lord, what, what, what is, you know, well, I had a Porsche and I had a, a Volkswagen. I mean, I had all kinds of transportation. And, and the, the horse required a bridle when my wife rode him. But when I rode him, I didn't have to use anything. I made up a rope bridle, which just went over his nose and it would just do a certain loop and I could pull it through the back and I could move him like that. I did that with my donkey. And, uh, uh, but the mule, uh, I don't care what I put on that thing. Her name was Mary. And Mary was kind, quite quite contrary. And, and I could tell Mary, no, oh, and I could pull, oh, she pulled the other way. And then she taught the donkey a bad trick. We were up in the mountains getting mangoes in buckets. And I had the little donkey, and the donkey was going to carry the buckets. I was tired, so I decided to ride the donkey a little bit. And I got on the donkey's back and just kind of sat back and just riding along. Well, she decided to go home. Her name was Beulah. Beulah went home. From the top of a volcano mountain all the way down to where we lived, she went home. Full tilt. Matter of fact, at one point, she just tilted her head forward and said, this guy that's on me, he's, he's too much for me to carry. She went like that, and I just slid right off the end of her head. I went tumbling down the hill. She went right on by me, kicking and jumping, and she was free. We had a discussion when I got home. And, and, and you know, when you have a horse and you have a bridle, you can control the horse. And, you know, God tries to guide us lovingly with his eye. Just the look of God. Just to look into his face in your prayer time and he'll guide you. But because you choose to do your own thing, he has to put a bridle in your mouth and pull on it. And it wears your mouth out. Are you hearing me? And here this, this Hebrew word now changes in Micah and it says, what doth the Lord demand of you but to do justly and to love mercy and kindness and to be humbled uh, and humble yourself and to walk humbly before your God? What does the Lord demand? How do you know God is demanding something of us today? 
He's not coming to ask us. He's coming to require of us, but he's coming to demand that require. We have the English word ask of instead of demand of. Because we don't want anybody to demand us. Hello. Now, I want you to get this. I'm going to look at this for a minute. First, what we need to do is look at what God requires. What is his demand? What is his requirement? Fear the Lord. Have you see that? That's in Deuteronomy. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. So God says, if you're going to really uh, do what I've required, you're going to learn to fear me. I can see by the way people live when they lie to God and lie to people that they don't fear God. I can see how people live when they out smoking and doping and drunk, jump, you know, jumping and, you know, sexting and all that. When they're out there doing their thing, they don't fear God. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the Christians. And when they live in bitterness and unforgiveness, they don't fear God because God could take your life and if he did right then, you are stuck with what you had in your heart. When you die, you go with what you got. And we need to understand that the Lord says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, my God, does a generation today need some wisdom? Oh my God. And wisdom comes from fearing God. When I fear God, I don't go out and do the things that the world's doing because I fear God. And that's a healthy fear. I hear these religious people say, no, the Lord doesn't want us to fear him. He's a loving God. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. He may be loving today, but if you ticked him off and he's mad, you better get ready. So wisdom comes. And then, of course, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I, I wish I could take, take the rest of the day. God's people need to learn that hate is a biblical emotion. Are you listening to me? Hate is is a biblical emotion. You must hate what God hates and love what God loves. And a lot of Christians don't hate what God hates. You should hate what's keeping you away from God. You should hate what's causing you to live in a, in a lustful, sinful life. You should hate that sin that's keeping you away from God. Hello? The statistic of pornography in the church today is staggering. It's up in the 90s. Saints, it's terrible. Because what happened, it came on TV and we became acceptable. It became acceptable. We just kind of blow it off. And it all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden. And then the doorways open, the gateways open. And the next thing you know, you are in it. Fear of the Lord is to hate evil. We must not buy into the compromising, political, correct, humanistic gospel that says it is wrong to hate. When you hear these sloppy, agape kind of mush mouth Christians go around telling you that it's okay, I mean, it's bad to hate. They're really telling you they don't want you to feel bad about what they're willing to do. Hello. We need to learn hate is a biblical emotion. It's one of the characteristics of God. You better believe he hated evil to the point that he let his son die to crucify and destroy the works of Satan. That's how bad he hated it. He hated it so bad he gave his own son to die so that that hatred would have its perfect justification and destroy sin. It is to stand in reverence and awe to 
to his holiness. Again, one of those words, we need holiness back in the church. Hello? Holiness. We need it back in the church. We need holiness back in the church. People that are shacking up, living around, hanging around, all that kind of junk. We need holiness back in the church. Hello? Don't tell me I'm old. You probably look older than I do. I'm well preserved. But because I like holiness don't mean anything with my age. I should like holiness at 16. I should like holiness at 14. And then he says, number two on this, if you were, it means he said to walk in his way. So he said uh, that we should, uh, what God requires is to fear God. Number one, Deuteronomy. Second thing he said was, is that we stand in reverence of his awesome holiness and to walk in all his ways. Number two, walk in his ways. That is to obey every commandment, statue of the Lord, to walk in holiness, truth, purity. How many you know we need to walk in this thing? Come on. Your walk needs to come close to your talk. Hello. And then the third thing he said, to love and serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Have you hear that? We need to love God with everything. Can you hear that today? That means with your soul, it means your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your soul is made up of three parts, mind, will, and emotion. That's called suke. The word is the Greek language soul means suke. It is mind, will, and emotions. You need, I need to make sure my, my soul is coming into compliance with the truth of God's word. And the only way my soul's ever going to learn it is I got to walk it out. Hello. Now, what it means now to serve him with all my heart and all my soul means no half-hearted relationships. Come on. <laughs> and then, what does the Lord, that's what the Lord asks. Now, we'll look at this. I'll give you three parts in Micah. This is what the Lord demands. See, he asked you to fear him. He asked you uh, uh, to uh, walk in his ways, and then he asks you uh, to, to love and serve him with all your heart and your soul. That's what he asks you to do. Now, I'm going to tell you what he wants to demand you to do. You look at it. In Micah, you look at verse the first part, that you might do justly. What does that mean? That means that you must have fair judgments. That you must do justly, must live Justly, How many of you know that if we had a God justice system in our hearts, we would make decisions based on that and they would be fair and not unfair. And because we don't have a God judgment system, we judge out of our soul. How do you hear that? We judge people out of our soul and we don't, Judge it with right judgment. Let me help you so you get this. Um, 1 Corinthians in the New Living Bible, Angela, the New Living Bible, New Living Testament, in 1 Corinthians 5.12 says it this way. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, Paul said. But it is certainly... But it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. Okay. Now, we don't like this. Paul said it clear. He said, Jesus said, don't judge those in the world. We are not to judge the world. But we are to judge those of the household of faith. Oh, come on, saints. So when, when we have sinners come in, it's not our place to judge them, but we are responsible to judge those who say their God is Jesus. And we must learn that that's one of our roles. That's why if you look where Paul dealt with uh, the, 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 the young man who was having a relationship with his father's wife which was a stepmother to this boy and 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 paul said put him out of the church 
Paul said, mark him. Hello? I tell you, saints, listen to me good. The church is on a different track than it has been in the last 20 years. And God shifted the track. You know how this switcher does on a train? He shifted the track, and the church is now going to move over to a new track. And it's not going to be an acceptance of all things. It's not going to be that. It's not going to be a, a church structure that's designed for entertainment of flesh. And there'll be a falling away, but there'll be a gathering on the other side. Good and evil can dwell together. And we're going to see a separation like never before. So he says here, he said, it is my responsibility. It is, is my responsibility to judge those inside, but it is not mine to judge those outside. So I must have judgment. So when it says in Micah that we should do justly, it means that my justice must be a just justice and it must be a godly justice. Let me hear that. That's why in my role, some people don't like the fact that I'll call sin what it is. I was preaching Thursday night. And there was a demon in the church running around. And I stopped the service and said, sit down. Stop running around. As soon as I did, the service went right back into where I could finish preaching. Oh, yeah. Some of you have been to realize, saints, that sometimes uh, there's demons in the back seat coming with you. That you refuse to get rid of. When you bring them in this house, I'm going to confront them. Hello. And how do you know it's the same thing with people that are in sin? When people are living in sin, you're going to hear about it. That's why a lot of churches today, you know, they don't, they don't even tell you, we don't preach about sin. We don't preach about sin. Because if you pre preach about sin, people are conscious of sin, and so it makes them want to go sin. How stupid is that? How stupid is that? Now, the second thing in Micah here, that you love mercy. So we have both. We have right judgment, judging those in the house of God. But then we have to have mercy, be kind one to another, tender heart of forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, uh, has forgiven you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, Jesus said. So, yeah, we're going to have to have a merciful attitude in the church. Have you here? But we must know the difference. The mercy that we should have is not to tolerate the sin. Come on. Is not to tolerate the sin. Now you hear me. When you develop a toleration for something, how many know it's like in medicine? When you take certain medicines for a period of time, they don't work anymore. Is that true? I mean, you know, when you develop a tolerance for lying, after a while, your lying don't bother you. When you develop a tolerance for doing things that are wrong, after a while, it's easy for you to do it because you just built up a, a tolerance for it, an acceptance of it. Hello? Now, the third thing is that you walk humbly with thy God. Micah again, you can read it, Micah's still up there. That you walk humbly with thy God. The proud man does not know God. And how do you hear that? Pride comes before the fall. I love the way Isaiah said, when Isaiah saw the Lord, he saw a vision of the Lord, he saw a real vision of the Lord. What's his words? Woe is me. I mean, that's, that's blowing your mind. I saw the Lord. You hear people today, I saw the Lord, and, and they, they, there's almost an arrogance. You're not going to have no arrogance when you stand before God. Read Revelation. Fire coming out of his eyes. His feet like brass. I mean, you've got to define how you see the Lord. You'll understand he's not somebody that you can flippantly think you can just look at. Daniel. When he saw the Lord, he said, my beauty was turned into corruption. I mean, how do you like to be Daniel? He's in there teaching, and a hand comes up out of the, 
atmosphere and starts writing on the board. Oh, I wish that hand would show up in the public school. My God. Woo, can you imagine? Everywhere you turn, there'd be a, a noise. The hand showed up. Ah! Kids would be freaking out. I was, in, I, I was in school. What happened? A hand just showed up. And it began to write my name and begin to tell what I did last night. If the hand of God showed up here today, would it be able to identify you and what you did last night? Wow. Now, look at this. These are the things that God required or demands of us. How do you hear that? We're going to walk humbly. We're going to have right judgments. Come on. You hear that? We're going to love mercy and kindness, but we're going to have the right judgment to judge sin when it's sin. How do you hear me today? How do you know right now in your heart you need to decide to start calling sin what it is and start, justif stop justifying it? Hello? You need to call it what it is. If you want to be free, you have to call that thing what it is. Now, so now we know what he asks of us, but we also know what he demands of us. Come a little further now. I got a piece here I'm going to give you that will help put all this together. It's like the, the super glue. Uh, we say, wow, I failed in all of those areas. <laughs> when we look at justice and mercy and those things, we could say, I'm not, I'm not doing the best. I'm not doing what he's demanded me to do. Would you agree with that? Paul said, the things I say I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. So I can understand where Paul was. Yet he said, I do this. I press to the mark of the high calling of God that's in Christ Jesus. He said, I haven't obtained yet, but I am, I'm pressing. I'm going to apprehend the thing I've been apprehended for. I'm pushing through. Come on. Now look at this. This will really help you. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Don't let what's wrong with you, when you look at your, your, the demands and you're not meeting them, don't look at what's wrong with you. Come on, come on. And keep, let it keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Isn't that good? What's wrong with me today will not keep me from running to the altar to get my life right. What's wrong with me today will not keep me from pressing into God. Some of you are so self-righteous that your own problem becomes the reason you don't go to God. Which is a contradiction. Your, your unrighteousness is what should drive you to God. People will say, well, I'm just not worthy. I'm not, you know, I know you're not. I, I don't deserve, you're right. And you know, I, I just got this, I, yes, you're right, you do. And so because you do, don't let what you do wrong keep you, come on, from worshiping what's right with God. Now, Jesus says something. I spoke on last Thursday evening, Matthew 5, 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. How I many of you know that's, a, that's again a statement. Jesus says you can be perfect. We just talked about the frailness of our life and how we can't a lot of times, but then Jesus comes and says, be perfect, even as your Father is perfect. Well, you say, well, how is that possible? I'm going to show you. Psychiatrists explain this condition about man this way. There is the ideal self, and then there's the real self. And they call this ego. And then they call the ideal self superego. These are psychological terms. The superego is what you perceive yourself to be, 
And the ego is what you actually are. Wow. I'm going to say it again so you get it. Psychiatrists have identified this condition of mankind and says, here's what it is. Uh, man has two conditions. Man has the ideal self and then the real self. And they call the one the real, the ego, and the ideal self is the superego. So the superego is what you perceive yourself to be. And the ego is what you really are. How many of you know God is so good because we live by faith. We don't live by what we see. We don't live by sight, but we live by faith. And how many of you know our condition of Christianity is based on my perception. As a man thinketh, so is he. So my perception in life uh, is I'm an overcomer. I'm a blood-washed Christian. Uh, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. My perception uh, is causing my real life uh, to lose grip on who I am because I am what I perceive and not what I really am. Wow. How many of you know, again, you speak to the thing that isn't as though it is. You know, we, we're hung up. Well, I want to be real. Well, then I want to be real too. But what I'm being real is that God came in my life. And, and I'm going to be real in my superego that is perception of what I'm being turned into rather than declare what I am. Because if all I declare is what I am, I'll never become what I'm meant to be. If all I dwell on is what I, it, what I am today, if I see, well, I, I blew it today. Well, get a divorce. I blew it today. Well, shoot yourself. I mean, you know, if we live in today, my real self stinks. But God says, uh, you become a new creature. And you say, but how? He said, because you've got to see your superego is that thing in you that's me in you. Wow. Are you getting that? The closer your ego is to the superego the more well-balanced you are. If there's a divergence, then you're going to have difficult mental problems. Because saints, if you live, how many of you know living by faith and by sight are two different things? I'm just telling you now. If you live by faith, you, you, you can't live by sight. Because by sight tells you your five senses are in play and you can't believe that's going to happen. But your faith says what your eyes are lying to you about. Because your eyes are limited to your ego, to your self, and your ego says you can't because my eyes tell me it's not possible. I'm crippled. I can't get out of the wheelchair. Look at, you ever hear some people say it? Look at me. Look at my condition. Faith says, get up. A young boy here went to this church for years. Uh, some of you know him. He dove in a swimming pool one night. In our youth group, broke his back, broke his neck, choom, paralyzed, neck down. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I went into the hospital to see him. He had been through a lot of time in there. and true, We had been there a bunch, but we went through this one time. And Corley and I went in there. And we were walking down this long hall to get to his room. And, uh, and I didn't know they were getting him out, putting him in the wheelchair, getting ready to bring him out. And some reason... There was a soccer ball. He was in a rehab type of hospital. And there was a soccer ball in the floor. So me, you know, I'm just being me. I, I kicked the ball. Rolls down. About that time, he came out of the room. Cannot move. And that ball was coming at his feet. 
came right out of his wheelchair and his right leg went like that. They freaked. Everybody, he freaked. The nurse yelled, hey! They were getting people. And, and hit it to him again. I kicked it. Now he couldn't do it again. But because he had that reaction, they knew something was working in there. I knew what was working. God was working. Because what they could see today, he just graduated from uh, London. He walked up, got a certificate. He's completely healed. God did a miracle for that kid. <clears throat> you see, because you see it, I'm talking about outward. The boy that came here and had cancer. He saw he was dying. Today he ain't dying. Right. How many of you know, saints? Uh, but I'm not talking about just the sight of things. I'm talking about in here. I'm talking about who you are as a new creature. That you can look at that thing and say, I am always going to be dumb. I'm going to always be stupid. I'm going to always be a loser. I'm going to always, 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 always. And you're denying what God said he did for you. For if God be in you, he, you're a new creature. And we need to get a hold of the perception. Reality is that I perceive, so I am. I perceive I'm a conqueror. I perceive wealth's coming my way. I perceive that I am an overcomer. We live by faith, not by sight. You see what I am? Christ, the new creature. Come on. Look what Jesus said. John 6, 28, 29. One day a group of uh, folks, uh, disciples came and asked Jesus what they must do to do the works of the Father. Uh, John 6, 28, 29. He says, what, what must we do to do? He said, what does God require of us? Jesus answered, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom the Lord hath sent. <clears throat> so the beginning, the work of God is you believing that he is who he says he is. The text in English there reads believe on. Your Bible says it different. Hello? The text there in English, believe on. But the Greek is literally translated believe into. Oh, you got to see it. He says, if you believe on, come on. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe on him, if you believe on him. But here's the best word. The Greek word is believe into. And it has to do with a word called motion. Another word, oh Jesus, is another word here. It, it, it is powerful. I'm going to give it to you in a second. But you have to believe into, not on. I say it like this. It is believing into Jesus. Many believe on Jesus, but they're never saved. It's believing into because you took motion. You moved into. You moved into. On, no, you moved into him. And he moved into you. How many of you know because he moved inside of you, you are now living with Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul said it's Christ in you, not on you. The Old Testament had the anointing on them, but God sent the anointing in you. You have the Holy Ghost in you. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. He's in you, the hope of glory. Samson, he's there. He's ready to tear down the, the temples. He's tied there. He's blinded. And he asked the Holy Spirit, come on me one more time. The Holy Spirit came on Samson. The Holy Spirit came on Joshua. The Holy Spirit came on them. But thank God Jesus said, when I go, I'm sending you somebody who ain't going to come on you, but he's going to come in you. And when he's in you, he's moved into you. So as we move into the relationship of Christ, 
we're moving from the real to the ideal, to the superego, where I now live by faith. My perceived new life, where Christ is everything I am. I perceive, I've moved in to. He's moved into. Come on. Philippians 1 6. Look what it says here. Philippians 1 6. Put it on the board. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual. Oh, I'm going to tell you what that word means in the Greek. We don't understand it. When we use that word affectional, <laughs> we, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, a hug or affectionate, you know, some kind of touchy thing. Look what it means. <laughs> Come on. So become affectional by the acknowledging of every good thing. How many you know every good thing is where? Which is in you, in Christ Jesus. How I many you know he said it's in you? Every good thing that God wants to do is in you. I'm going to say it again. Every good thing that God wants to do is in you. As long as you have a life with him outside and not inside, you will live the way you want to live. Tyler, get up a minute. Come here. <laughs> get up here and walk up here. Come on. Now, have you know, if Tyler is you and me, and we're walking across here, and I'm in him, okay? Now, if I'm on him, he didn't, he didn't put me on today. Okay? Would you, do you mind, come here, yes. get down here, you're going to be the other piece of this. You see, he didn't put me on today. I hear the Bible says, put on Christ, put on Christ. So I ain't got him on. So there's temptation, there's evil, there's all kinds of wicked things. And he's just walking along. Now how many of you know he's walking right into it? But... If, he's, if I'm in him, <laughs> I don't even know if I'm in him, and he starts walking. I'm saying, hey, 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 ain't going that way. Hey, hey, I don't want to go that way. You're taking, I don't want to go back that way. What do you mean you're not? No, you're going to church. What do you mean? Because when I'm in him and he's in me, I go where he goes. I go and do what he says do. Because when he says, I don't want you going there, I can't go there. But when I have him on me, I can leave him in the closet so I can go do my thing and don't have to worry about him. Wow. I say, Lord... May I take full understanding today that I have Christ in me, the hope of glory. Do you know that word effectual, where it says communication of faith may become effectual? It is the Greek word in, in, in energio, energio, and it is the word energy. It means activated. <laughs> that word effectual means I've activated something. How many of you know when you get a new credit card, you have to do something? What do you have to do? You have to activate it. Now, how many of you know all the money's there? All the power and authority and all the permission is there. You just have to do one thing, activate it. How many of you know you've got the Holy Ghost? You've got the power of God in you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You have the anointing of God in you. You have the deutimus of God inside of you. And all you have to do when you face issue, when you face a problem, is do what? I got to activate my card. Because if God be for me, who can be against me? Because you activate what is inside what is already available. All the wealth, all the blessing that that card might bring to you is already there. And Christ in you is already there. All you've got to do, I don't want to be in a tragedy. I don't want to be in an emergency. When I was in a plane crash, uh, when I was in a plane that blew up, the motor blew up. I didn't want to be there trying to make my card activate. 
because Jesus was with me. I'll never forget that, that time we were at New York and the plane was getting ready to take off. It was snowing, storm, blowing the plane around. It was a prop, oh, a little prop plane. And this guy, the lady said, Sir, well, we're not going to go. They've told us we can't leave. We can't clear. It's too stormy. We're going back. I had to go preach, and I just said, Dak, oh. The guy behind me said, Jesus Christ. Not like I would say it. And I, before I even thought, I yelled, amen. The girl came back and said, well, we've just been cleared. We're going. I said, thank you, Jesus. But two, there's a witness. Even if he didn't mean it, I took the authority and I made his negative become a positive and the plane flew. Get up on your feet today. Say, Lord, thank you. I'm going to turn the negatives of life into a positive and I'm going to say, if God be for me, who can be against me? I'm going to declare with my mouth that God is in me. I'm a great uh, overcomer because God is inside of me. I'm carrying around. Uh, you think you're going to find the manger? You think you're going to find uh, Jesus? Jesus at the department store. You're carrying Jesus in the store with you. You got him in you. You got him in you. He couldn't find the manger. He couldn't find the manger. He had to get in you. He couldn't find a house. But he got inside of you. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you that, Jesus, you're in me today. You're in me of hope. You're in me of a faith. You're in me of a purpose. I moved you in. see some of you some of you need to clean up your house because you can't move him in till you get rid of some of the junk some of you can't get him in because you got too much junk in the house how do you know you got to get rid of some of the stuff so you can move him in you got to make room for him to come in you got to make room for him to come in you got to say, no, I'm going to put away that stuff. I'm going to put away my drugs. I'm going to put away my alcohol. I'm going to put away my stuff and sex and things. I'm going to put away that stuff because uh, I'm going to make room for him. He looked around and, and there was no room in the inn, uh, but he found room in me because he came inside me. And when I go into the store, I ain't looking for Jesus in the store. I'm bringing Jesus in the store. When I get in the fight of my life, I ain't looking for him to be on me. I'm looking for him to be in me. When I get in the fight, I bring him to the fight. I bring him into the fight, for greater is he that's in me. He that's in me, he that's in you, he that's in you. Greater, greater is he that's inside of you. You gotta stop putting him on like a coat. Come on, you gotta stop putting him on like a coat. You get up in the morning and, and, and some of you are discombobulated in your order of life. You have no discipline. You don't manage your life. Hello. He said, well, you, has he been to my house? Yeah, in the spirit. And how many of you know some of you that are pack rats? In the spirit. <laughs> how many of you know you got no room for him? And then you got to put him on. And then if you forget to put him on, that's the day the enemy shows up. You see, I told somebody the other day, I fly these little teeny planes. I mean, I fly planes that you have to get on them like this. You walk down the thing to sit down, and I literally have to go like that. And when you sit down, I, I, I fly with a lot of these Caribbean ladies. And they are, they are fully ripe. 
And like the one that was sitting beside me, she got in and she kind of had to sit a little cockeyed and sideways and, and, and the seatbelt wouldn't fit. And she was struggling and they, she'd ask her, they don't even come back, talk to you. And down the runway you're going. If you ain't buckled in, too bad. They don't care. And things are loose. The window the other day was broken. Piece of the seat fell off. Screws are falling off. I'm collecting screws. <laughs> I love excitement. And and this one lady, she, she's fighting, and we're already down the runway. She looks at me. I said, put my hand on her. I said, and <laughs> you're sitting like this, you know. I said, uh, look, sweetheart, don't worry about it. As much struggle as you had getting in that seat. This plane's going to have to turn upside down for you to get out of the seat. She looked at me. I thought, oh, Lord, she's going to be offended. And she, she broke into laughter. She said, ah, ha, 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 that's so good. She just took the seatbelt, dropped it, said, let's go. And away we flew. See, because when I got up in the morning, I didn't have to worry about me putting him on. When I got up in the morning, he was inside of me waiting for me to get up. He was already inside of me saying, son, I've been waiting for you to get up. Uh, I've been awake and ready to go. So when I get on the plane, uh, me and Jesus walk on the plane. Uh, and if Jesus has to make the plane fly with a hand full of bolts in this hand and a piece of the window in this hand and a broken seat in this hand, uh, that plane's going where it's destined to go because I'm in the plane uh, and greater is he that's in me. Put your hands up and say, Lord, thank you for being in me today. Thank you for super ego today, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for that perception. I perceive with my heart, I perceive with my faith that Jesus is in my life. I perceive that I'm born again. I perceive that I'm blood washed. I'm perceiving that God is my source. Father, I pray for those that are in this room. If you're here today, you're not saved, you're not right with God. Or you fell away from God or you got cold or you're not sure let's change it right now let's change it right now and if you want to give after we've prayed you can still do that but let me just say this if you're standing here today eyes closed and heads bowed and you just don't really have that assurance blessed assurance Jesus is mine if you don't have that, don't play the game anymore. Don't let the enemy trick you by thinking you can walk out of here and everything's going to be good. It ain't going to be good. You're going to still have all that mess going on. And you need to change the course of your life by putting your life in God and by letting God come in you. Father, I pray right now, if they're here today, that there'll be a response because of the faith that's here today for our lives to be changed. If that's you, slip your hand up and say, I want you praying for me, Pastor. Put it up there. Yes, yes, yes. Put it up. I'm going to pray for you. Put it up. Let me see your hand. Hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up. Yes, yes. I see your hands all over, all over, all over. Put your hand up. I'm going to pray. This is a good prayer today because God's going to do something miraculous in this place. Father, I see those. Here's what I want you to do. Those with your hands up, run down here real quick. I'm going to pray. Can Get up, get up, come on down here right now, right now. Just get out of your seat. Come here right now. I'm going to pray for you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, right now, right now, right now. This is not about joining church. It's about praying. If you ain't willing to walk, you ain't willing to live. Come on, get out of your seat. You raise your hand. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, right now, right now, right now. Many of you praised your hand. I'm telling you, don't play this game. Don't play this game. If you raise your hand, get down here right now. Get down here. Son, come on. You raise your hand. Let me pray with you. It's the best prayer you ever had. Come on. Come on, sweetheart. That's right. Come on, mom. Come on. Bring them down here. Bring them down here. That's right. Come on. Come on. Come on. Anybody else? Come on. You raise your hand. You raise your hand. You raise your hand. Don't you just let that devil lie to you. Some of you are standing there right now, and Satan is whispering into your ear. And he's lying to you right now. I rebuke that lie in the name of Jesus. And I pray right now, you'll defy that lie by an action of boldness that you'll just step out and say, I'm not going to be tricked again. I'm not going to be lied to anymore. I'm done with it. I'm going to really give my life to God. Come on. Come on. Right here. Wayman. Wayman, right here. Come on. Hook them up. Come on, Wayman. You're good enough for them. Come on. Sweetheart, come on. Bring that offering down here. You put it right here on this plate. Come on. 
you. God's still moving. God's still working. Keep praying, saints. Keep praying. Come on, sweetheart. Put it right down there. If you need prayer, stay right up here and we'll pray for you. If you need prayer, just stay right up here and we'll pray for you if that's you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Quickly, quickly, quickly. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for those that have come today. I thank you for the miracle of salvation, turning around, changing of hearts. Decisions are being made right now that will alter the course of many others. Generations will be affected by this prayer. So, Lord, I thank you today. The prayer of salvation is upon them. An anointing has come. Lord, the preachers are coming out of the, oh, they're coming out of the streets. Lord, in the name of Jesus, uh, I declare, Lord, uh, healing is happening. Miracles are happening. I declare that power is being released. Uh, power and anointing is being released. Uh, those of you that are praying, just pray the best prayer you ever prayed. Wayman, I pray for healing for that man. I pray for healing over that man you're praying with, Wayman. He needs healing right now. He needs healing in his body. Release the anointing. Release the anointing. Get some oil, Mel. Put some oil on his head. Quickly, quickly. Come on, get some oil and put it on him. Antonio, get oil in your hand. Just go by and pray for each person. She needs healing in her body. She needs healing in her body right there. Come on, right now. Father, in the name of Jesus. Come on, release your faith today. Release Jesus in this house today. Release the Lord in this house.